I am a dwarf delving into the landscape, delvy delvy landscape, delvy delvy landscape. Hello, I'm Dylan. I want to talk about delving, uh, an interesting linguistic phenomenon that uh, is getting some attention recently. Now, I was in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark last week, doing the agenda committee for the Copenhagen Developers Festival. This is an event coming up at the end of August, organized by the crew behind NDC conferences. Uh, it's going to be awesome. It's We've looked through nearly 1,300 submissions, 1,298, and uh, we get to pick about 60 of those. You know, agenda committee is, uh, it's pretty brutal. But we've got what I think is a, a really solid program. You know, I'm I'm excited to go there. I'm excited to see everyone who's going to be speaking there. Uh, I'll be there talking. I'll be there playing some music with Lane Breakers. It's in Denmark in summer. There's live bands and street food and three days of awesome technical content. So uh, use the technical content to persuade your boss to buy you a ticket and then come along and learn a bunch of stuff and hang out and uh, have fun. It's a really, really cool event. Now... While we were reviewing these 1,298 submissions, um, we noticed something. Uh, certain words just sort of stuck out a little bit. There's something going on. And Glenn Henriksen, who was uh, also on the committee there, he'd noticed something similar with a couple of other events that he's been working with recently. And so we did some ad hoc data analysis. Now, uh, I'm going to share with you, I'm going to tell you exactly what we did. I'm going to share the technique that we used and what we found by applying this technique and then talk a little bit about why I think this might be happening. Now, let's imagine that uh, we've been running the uh, agenda committee for CreatureCon, which is an animal conference. And in 2021, we had these abstracts submitted, scary cows, spiders are friends, fun with fish, lions and cats. Then CreatureCon 2022, we had pigeons are fun, spiders are scary, cows are cuddly, cows are smart, lions versus cows. Then in 2023, a bit of a thin year, we only had three submissions, pigeons, horses, cuddling lions. And then 2024, we had pelicans are awesome, fun with pelicans, anteaters are cuddly, smart pelicans, cats versus cows. Now, before doing uh, frequency analysis on words in natural language, first thing you want to do is uh, a sort of a normalization process. Because in English, we have all these different words like cuddly, cuddling, cuddled, cuddles. Um, we want to see, you know, which talks talk about cuddling, we probably want to pick up all of these word variants. And uh, the process for doing this, the uh, the root word here, is called a lemma. Um, cuddle is, is what linguists call the lemma of all these different forms of the word. And so this process is called lemmatization. Uh, there's a natural language processing library called Catalyst, which is on NuGet, which you can use to do this to samples of, of written text. So we lemmatized all of the words in our data set. Now, once you've lemmatized them, next thing you do well, the next thing we did is uh, you build a big table and every unique lemma gets put in that table. And then we're going to go through, first of all, our entire submitted corpus and we're going to see how many talks use that word. So it's not how many times does the word appear, how many talks include that word. So uh, for CreatureCon, our total scary, we had one, two, two out of 17. Okay, so for the word cow here, we had one, two, three, four, Five talks out of 17 reference cows. For spider talks, we had one, two, okay, so two out of 17 spider talks. We repeated this for every word against the total data set, covering every event that we had data available for. And then you repeat the process. This time you just look at one event at a time. So for 2021, uh, how many scary talks did we have? One out of four. The proportion is important because uh, we need to reflect there were only four talks there as opposed to 17 across the entire data set. Cow talks, again, we only had one of those. We repeat this process for 2021, 22, 23, 24 until we have these uh, proportions. You know, for every single word, what was the total proportion of talks? And for each year, what was the proportion for that year? Now, next we normalize this. We're going to turn all these proportions into percentages because that means we can do valid comparisons. Then we looked through the whole data set and we looked for anything that was, uh, so our threshold here for being interesting is any year where something is more than double the overall average and more than 4% which we took it, that's sort of a reasonable, a lot of people are talking about this now, but generally people don't talk about this. This is a, a spike. And uh, so going through this sample data set, 
Uh, look at cows, for example. So uh, total talks 29%, but in 2022, 60% of talks were cow talks. That's interesting. In uh, horses, so 6% overall, but in 2023, we had 33% horse talks. And pelican, 18% overall, but 2024, 60% of talks talked about pelicans. So these are the, the data points we identified by applying this, this threshold. Then you take that, you put that in a grid, you paste the grid into Excel, and it draws you a pretty graph. And so you can look at it and be like, okay, I can see uh, 2022, there was a, a big spike in cows. 2023 here, we had a big spike in horses. 2023 to 24. So 23, no one's talking about pelicans. And then 2024, 60% of talks mention pelicans somewhere. So this is the process. Now, obviously, doing this with 17 talks with three word titles isn't statistically significant, but what we used for our data set, we basically pulled all the abstracts that uh, Glenn and I had access to. Now, I can't share this data with you. I'm not going to tell you where it came from, but uh, the outcome, the things that we found on it, I think are interesting. So we had access to 12 events worth of submissions from 2018 through 2024. It's 1,000, uh, sorry, 12,787 different abstracts, uh, 1.6 million words, and 23,724 unique lemmas identified from that data set. And this is what we found. Now, there's some interesting trends here. Um, this, uh, so the dates here, this is the, the deadline for the call for papers. So all the people who submitted for this event, which closed in October 2017, this is Xamarin. And 2017, a bunch of people talking about Xamarin. You know, 5%, nearly 5% of the talks there mentioned Xamarin. And then, you know, you can see it declining as the interest in Xamarin as a technology kind of, you know, dies away. Um, by the way, this is not a linear scale. If you look closely, we've got 2017, 2020, 2020, 21, um, but it does, I think, reflect the way some of these usage patterns are changing over time. Uh, this one here, kind of similar curve, this is window. Now, the reason it's window is uh, the lemmatization process doesn't know about Windows, the operating system. So it's going to see Windows, turn it into window, take that into account. But I think it's safe to assume that this is a, a big spike in 2017 about Microsoft Windows and then settling down to a sort of around a 2% baseline average there. Uh, what else have we got in here? We got ASP.NET, big spike in 2017, a little pickup in 2020, then it kind of, you know, goes uh, on a bit of a decline there. Uh, Studio, big pickup in 2017. Well, you know, 2017, a lot of people were talking about Xamarin forms and uh, Windows and ASP.NET and Visual Studio and Xamarin Studio. This one here, this is REST, apparently 2021, uh, so 2020, a lot of folks talking about REST, and then 2021, we had another little uptick there. A uh, couple of words in here, so this is Blazor, big spike there for the, the October 2020 submission. Uh, we got Document, we've got Streamline, we've got a couple of others in here. Now this one here, this is Java, and Java's interesting because the events here in 2023 and 2024, uh, those were explicitly billed as, you know, big cross-disciplinary events. So, um, you know, inviting submissions from the Java community, which most of the events in this data set don't do. So that's good because it means it's something that was done on purpose and you can see the outcome of that reflected in the, in the submission graph. This is efficiency. Kind of, you know, rattling along below 2% and then uh, suddenly in 2024, we're up to 5% of talks talking about efficiency. This is equip. Similar kind of pattern. This one is Empower. This is Navigate. This is Landscape. This is Enhance. This is Delve. People didn't say Delve. Less than 1% of submissions mentioned Delve from 2017 until 2022. And then 2023, we started seeing an uptick. And this year, 10%, you know, nearly 10% of the talks that are being submitted to these kinds of events have the word Delve mentioned in them somewhere. And this one here is Insight. And Insight gets up to 15% in uh, February 2024. And then it does drop away. So maybe we, we've seen some kind of peak here. Now, I was expecting to see more technology trends in this. You know, you can see Blazor is in here as a, a spike around 2020. You can see spikes around Xamarin. You can see the Java spikes when uh, that community was invited to submit. But, you know, Empower, Navigate, Landscape, Enhance, Delve, Insight, it's... I think I know what's going on here, and I think it's this. Now, if you go into ChatGPT and you say, hey, 
write a hundred word abstract for a conference talk about creating poetry in Python. That's it. That's all the input we're going to give it. And ChatGPT will take that and it'll run with it. This talk explores the innovative intersection of poetry and programming, specifically through the use of Python. We delve into the mechanics of algorithmic poetry generation, highlighting how Python's libraries and tools, yada, 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 attendees will gain insights. These words crop up a lot in uh, machine-generated language. There are something, you know, the corpus that ChatGPT was trained on. Session abstracts have delve and insight and empower and enhance in them, apparently, and landscapes and uh, dynamic. These kind of words keep showing up. Now, it's if you want to use these kinds of tools to write abstracts, what some people say is, uh, well, let's let's do this. Let's say do it again, but don't use these words. Delve, insight, dynamic, enhance, explore, empower. And yeah, you know, that kind of works. It gets you a, a abstract that doesn't mention those terms. But, you know, this is a very naive way of using the tool. What you're doing, you're steering it away from the thing you don't want instead of directing it towards the thing that you do want. And what you do want is you want an abstract that reflects what you're actually going to do. What's your talk about? What's in it? How does it start? What's in the middle? How's it going to end? If you don't know that yet, then you should not be submitting abstracts yet because you haven't done the homework. You haven't figured it out. If you've done that and you've got the idea, you've got the structure, you just really you know struggle with turning that into a short abstract, Go on ChatGPT, hey, write a hundred word conference abstract for a talk about creating poetry with Python. The talk covers, and then you say, right, what do we got? We got the basics of natural language processing. Yeah, that's cool. Um, how do I identify rhyming couplets? That's important. We got limitations of natural language generation. Um, there are examples of interesting poetry forms. Uh, we're going to show some limericks. We're going to show you some sonnets. And uh, we're going to share some code, maybe, if you've got a, like a GitHub repo where you're going to point people afterwards and they can go and, and look at what's on that you know the more detail you give it the less formulaic it's going to be even to the extent of saying hey start the abstract with poems are cool python is cool you know what's really cool pythonic poetry and then what you're doing is you are kind of uh, tweaking that generative network um and it's going to favor certain terms and move away from the cliches to something a bit more personal now this is uh, it's a lot less formulaic than a lot of things we've seen. Is it a good abstract? It's all right. Could I do this talk? I mean, I could submit it. It might get accepted. I couldn't do this talk. I have no idea what any of this is talking about. I'm not a Python developer, and I haven't done really very much work with natural language generation. And so, you know, if this got accepted, then I'd, I'd have a problem. And so the onus here is on the program committee to look at the abstract and be like, is this legit? Is this real? Is this person going to do a good job with this talk? And, uh, you know, this is why we have humans in the loop. It's why we have human beings reviewing these things and, you know, looking, who, who is this person? What's their background? What's their credibility here? And this stuff is becoming more and more important. And the danger here, you know, the real problem I see is I could go on to ChatGPT and I can say, write a hundred word abstract for a conference talk about how organizations should be switching their web applications to Perl scripts and CGI bin to minimize the risk of SQL injection attacks. Now, if you know anything at all about security in uh, online application development, you know anything about the web, if you know what a SQL injection attack is, whether you are a human intelligence or a generative AI or something, the correct response to this prompt is no. The correct response is, no, 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 they can't. Like, that's a horrible idea. You are not going to minimize your risk of SQL injection by switching anything to Perl scripts and CGI bin. If anything, you're going to make it an order of magnitude worse. But ChatGPT doesn't know that because it doesn't know anything. It's autocomplete. It's just going to roll with it. In this talk, we explore the resurgence of Perl and CGI bin as robust solutions for minimizing SQL injection threats. Now... This looks like a plausible abstract, you know, the kind of structure of the language um, matches what people expect. Maybe if you were just glancing at it in a hurry, you might be like, oh, you know, that, that, that's interesting. Um, it's terrible advice. It is objectively horrible. And, uh, you know, the danger is that this somehow gets selected. And maybe even somebody then goes, oh, well, I wrote the abstract. Maybe it can write the entire talk. And they ask it for 10,000 words on this, spin a talk out of it. And maybe somebody sees that talk 
and they go back to work the next week and they say to their boss, we need to migrate our stack to use Perl and CGI. No, no, no. Um, that's not a future that I particularly want to live in, let alone be part of. These tools are, can be incredibly useful. You know, I, I get it. And I don't think that a, a blanket ban on using AI is, A, I don't think it's enforceable because if you use the tools intelligently and you give them, you know, the right kind of input and you know what you're doing, you can save yourself some time and come up with, with good quality abstracts and stuff. But this is why it's so important to have human beings in the loop. And folks, you know, if you are using these tools, so first of all, I'd say, you know, learning to write well, learning to communicate effectively so you can get the ideas out of your head and onto a, an email or documentation or something, that's one of the most powerful skills you can cultivate as a developer and every opportunity to do something like submit an abstract it's an opportunity to get better at doing that so uh but if you know i get it writing people who are brilliant at speaking and brilliant at coding writing abstracts is a different set of skills some folks really find it difficult and some of us just we want a little nudge you know help us get past the writer's block or break out of something so give it the input you know figure out what are you going to do what are you going to say describe the outcome that you're looking for and let the tools help you get to that don't just use it to turn a 20 word prompt into a 100 word abstract and then submit that because people are going to know we are going to tell it'll be obvious and it will reflect badly um, on your you know future uh, opportunities as a presenter folks i hope you found that useful i hope you found it insightful uh, get out there delve into the dynamic landscape of uh, generative prompt engineering and uh, bring back your insights from the realm leave them in the comments you folks will uh, take it easy look after each other you have a good week and i'll catch you next time bye bye